cultural crusade all across America. This is the Michael Medved Show. The problem with trying to understand history is that unavoidably, when you're looking at history, you're looking backward. You know how things turned out. You know, for instance, that this tiny little group called the Pilgrims somehow is important to us, tremendously important. We have a holiday in which we celebrate their survival. But if you're sitting there in the winter of 1620 and 1621, freezing to death, starving, watching your best friends, very often your wives, dropping dead around you. You don't know how things are going to turn out. What do you know? You know you are in what is rightly referred to as a howling wilderness. You have no idea whether some of the natives who must be out there somewhere are going to be hostile or friendly. You don't know how you're going to feed yourself, and you don't know emphatically if you are going to survive. After all, these pilgrims who came over to this new continent certainly knew about the lost colony of Roanoke some 30 years before, where an entire colony disappeared without a trace. They knew about a half dozen other attempts to start little settlements or fishing villages in what later became known as New England. These didn't last. They didn't survive. They certainly knew that the winter that they were enduring was far harsher than anything, anything they had experienced in the old country. Who were these people? Well, by and large, they were ordinary, common, hardworking people, but with a real touch of of deep piety and even scholarship. Look at William Bradford. William Bradford who became governor of the colony and wrote the entire record of Plymouth plantation of this Plymouth colony, had a fascinating life. His father died when he was just a year old and his mother married again. And his grandfather and uncles took him in hand and trained him as a farmer. At the age of 12, he became a constant reader of the Bible. And when he was just a teenager, He became so moved by the word of God that he joined this group of rebel Puritans who met for prayer and discussion at the house of William Brewster in this very scenic and and picturesque little village of Scrooby. And when that group, inspired by one of their leaders, organized itself into a separate church and got ready to leave England, Bradford joined it despite the, quote, wrath of his uncles and the scoff of his neighbors. Imagine that, a religious rebel looked down upon by the people around him, largely through his own efforts. This fellow learned Dutch after they moved to Holland, and he also learned a great deal of Latin and Hebrew, and he acquired a wide knowledge of general literature. The most amazing thing is that he brought over with him on the Mayflower and then had sent to him subsequently a huge library of books. He lived for books and lived for writing in his own book, the record of what he and the other pilgrims endured. One of the things that he endured is his wife, Dorothy, throwing herself, so it would seem, off the side of the Mayflower before they had even begun to build those sheds, those huts that would protect them from the winter. Perhaps she had been a Cassandra, seeing the future more clearly than others in that little band because that winter was grim almost beyond belief and endurance. Six pilgrims died in December, then eight in January. On January 14th, they were huddled, sick, hungry. We're not even sure what exactly was the disease that killed so many of them, but it could have been any number of things. Certainly they were malnourished. Certainly a lot of the food they ate was probably rotten. Some of the kernels of corn they had found buried underground, flint corn, not particularly nourishing or good for them. But on January 14th, there was an icy wind, as only a Massachusetts wind can be icy, blowing through cracks in the nearly completed meeting house. Understand that these pilgrims would not build a church. They never, ever had a church. They had a meeting house. 
In their language, church referred to the group of people who comprised the church. The building was the meeting house. They were gathered in the meeting house, many of them lying on the ground, holding their stomachs, moaning, sick. And suddenly, before anybody knew what was going on, since they were warming themselves with a fire, the thatched roof above them had caught fire and the interior was filled with smoke. Many people who were helpless with illness started to cry out in horror. The embers and some of the beams began to fall from the roof. Some of the sick people raised themselves with a strength that seemed more than human. Fortunately, most of the timbers did not catch fire, and the building was saved. Uh, By the way, they had some casks of gunpowder right there. They could have all been blown to kingdom come had they not put out the fire in time. But during this fire, much of their precious clothing was burned up, and they were further exposed to the harsh New England winter, and still the death toll mounted and added up. In February, they were dying at the rate of two a day, two deaths every day, people who needed to be buried. Digging in the frozen ground was itself a challenge to bury your friends and family. On some days, three died. The 21st of February, four people died. At one period, the entire company had only five men who were well enough to walk around and care for the sick. One of them was Captain Miles Standish. Standish was not a member of the separatist community. Remember, he was called a stranger. He is someone who had come along for adventure, but he ended up becoming part of the company and a stalwart of the company. He was a little man. His enemies called him Captain Shrimp later. Apparently, he was very, very short. He had red hair. He was also called Our Little Chimney because it was easy to get him sparking and flaming. He had a temper. But meanwhile, he was one of the few who didn't get desperately ill. He tended to Bradford, among the others, raising his head up and cradling it in his arm just to spoon him a little bit of soup. Meanwhile, in the harbor, the sailors stayed on the Mayflower. They didn't want to come ashore in the midst of the sickness. They stayed because Captain Christopher Jones, that good and generous man, had listened to the pleas of the pilgrims to stay around to help them. But people on board the Mayflower were dying as well. One of them, the bosun, was stricken described by Bradford as a proud young man who would often curse and scoff at the passengers. But when he grew weak, they had compassion on him and helped him. Then he confessed that he did not deserve it at their hands. He had abused them in word and deed. Oh, said he, you, I now see, show your love like Christians indeed to one another. But we let one another lie and die like dogs. In March, another thirteen died, but at least that was less than the month before. Finally, when they were able to count the losses of the 102 people who had crossed the ocean, 47 had died. The biggest toll, the most painful toll, was by March, 13 of 18 wives had died. What those wives had died doing was protecting their children because the children fared best All seven daughters lived, and ten of the thirteen sons lived. But the grown women, they were nearly all gone. And somehow, somehow, they kept their hopes up, and they kept alive, partially through coming up every Sunday to meet at the meeting house from the little huts they had built separately, listening to the preaching of William Brewster, who assured him that somehow this was all God's will. But finally, by the middle of March, things began to look a bit better, especially when the sun came out and they knew that spring would not be far behind. There was one particular day in the middle of March. It was a Friday. It was fair. The sky was blue. And they always look back on that day as a key turning point, even though the day began badly. They were still weak. They were still fearful when they saw a tall, muscular, 
Indian wearing only a loincloth walking toward them. They shouted out, Indian coming! Indian coming! And they approached, carrying their firearms. But as he drew within range, this Indian shouted out in perfect English, Welcome! It was a deep, resonant voice. Then they replied, Welcome! And then, in a fateful interchange, the next word from the Indian is, Have you got any beer? And so the encounter continued and followed a shocking and surprising course. special edition of the Michael Medved Show on the real story behind Thanksgiving. And part of that real story that you can absolutely use to win any game of Trivial Pursuit is what were the first fateful words in English from Indians to Pilgrims in 1621. And the first fateful words were welcome in a deep, resonant voice in perfect English, welcome Have you got any beer? Well, (laughs) the pilgrims didn't have any beer. And what do you say? This Indian walks in from nowhere. He looks pretty intent on his beer. What they say is, our beer is gone. Would you like some brandy? And the answer, to no one's surprise, was, you betcha. So they sit down and drink some brandy together. It turns out that this particular Indian is named Samoset. Samoset was a sagamore of the Algonquins. He was uh, from up near Maine. He had developed both his English language skills and his taste for beer in contact with a number of the English fishermen who had colonized, tried to colonize a little bit, tried to set up some villages, had sailed up and down along the New England coast. He enjoyed spending time with them. He particularly enjoyed their liquid refreshment. And now he told the pilgrims some fascinating news. The reason that they had been able to establish their settlement in Plymouth where they had on land that appeared to have been once inhabited, land that was cleared, but with absolutely no human beings anywhere around, is because this was land that had once belonged to the Patuxet tribe. The Patuxet had all died about six months before the pilgrims arrived in one of those bizarre coincidences leaving behind this area with springs and and cleared land and even some corn stored away, not a single person seemed to have been left of this small tribe. The nearest tribe was under command of a a big chief named Massasoit, and Massasoit, or Massasoit, was um, actually was not such a big tribe. It was some 600 people, but compared to the 50 or so pilgrims who were left, That looked pretty formidable. He was a couple of days' journey away, if you took your time. What Samoset said that was so particularly interesting is there was a Christian Indian, a Christian Indian, again, who spoke perfect English, who was living with Massasoit. And soon, as the spring wore on, that Indian, whose name was Squanto, Tisquantum was his actual Indian name. He's known to history as Squanto. He, when he met the pilgrims, changed everything, everything. As William Bradford declared in his own recollections, this Indian, Squanto, was a special instrument sent of God for their good beyond their expectation. He directed them how to set their corn, where to take fish, and to procure other commodities, and was also their chief pilot to bring them to unknown places for their profit and never left them till he died. Squanto's story really begins in 1605. Now, we don't know exactly when he was born, but we know that by 1605 he was a teenager, and he was out hunting with his fellow Native Americans, fellow Indians, when a miserable human being, a miserable excuse for a human being named Thomas Hunt, a one-time colleague of John Smith of Virginia and a sea captain, 
This Thomas Hunt spotted them. Now, he and his men came ashore, and they took Squanto captive along with four of his friends. Why would they want to capture these guys? They captured them and clapped them into irons and took them with other Indians they collected to make money by selling them as slaves. Squanto was taken prisoner. He was made into a slave, and he was brought to England, where he worked as a slave, worked as a servant, and lived there in England for nine years. And as slaves could at the time, he saved little bits of this and that. He worked on his own, and finally he was able to buy his way, partially to talk his way, into freedom. He met Captain John Smith. Right, that same Captain John Smith of Jamestown, the guy with Pocahontas famously. John Smith was getting together a new voyage in 1614 to go back to New England, which of course is where Squanto came from. So Squanto asked if he could get on that voyage and go back to his people. Captain Smith, for a price, of course, agreed. And so Squanto headed back home. He was reunited with his family. He was reunited with his villagers. And, of course, his heart sang. He was so delighted. He was so thrilled. But his happiness didn't last because as soon as Captain Smith departed, again, another ship came along, a British ship with a captain who began capturing slaves. And this time, He wasn't fortunate enough to be taken in slavery to England. He was taken to Spain, and that was much, much worse. It was a disaster, in fact, because the Spanish were known as the most cruel slave masters of that era. His friends were sold to North Africa. They were sold, by the way, for 20 pounds each, which is the equivalent of about $1,400 a head, a lot of money at the time. So just before they were about to sell Squanto to go to North Africa, where he unquestionably would have worked out the rest of his short life, and life was short for slaves in that circumstance, some Catholic friars appeared on the scene. And these Catholic friars had mercy and they had compassion. The friars were able to buy and rescue a few of the Indian slaves who were there for sale, including Squanto. So he went to live with the friars in a monastery, and they made him into a Christian. He accepted Christ and became a Christian believer. Now, he never was a particularly well-educated Christian, but he learned to speak perfect English and perfect Spanish. He learned to pray every day and became, at least on one level, quite devout. And with the help of these friars who had befriended him and were impressed by his fine mind and his remarkable character, he got enough money to pay for his voyage back to the New World. Second time, going back to that village that he had left, the Pawtuxet village in what is today Massachusetts. He finally arrived just a few months Before the pilgrims got there, he landed in Massachusetts, walked back to his village, and he found it absolutely deserted. He heard the news then that everyone had all died. In deepest melancholy, Squanto went to live with Massasoit. He had been living with him for several months when Massasoit came in April of 1621 to meet the pilgrims, and Squanto came along. Try to think about this for a moment. I mean, the chances of finding a fervently Christian Indian who would provide them with help. And with the harvest that they planted and with the summer going forward, they actually were doing much better. Was it a flourishing colony? By no means. You're talking about a remarkably small number of people who were greatly enhanced and helped by this squanto. But they were happy enough at the end of the spring and the summer of their planting, to want to celebrate their survival and the fact that things were looking up. And so they called a day of thanksgiving, and they invited Chief Massasoit. That seemed like a politic thing to do. They had enough to serve. They actually caught some wild fowl, apparently. They had some vegetables that they had grown. They had some corn. But the problem is, when Massasoit arrived for this feast, which we don't know exactly the date, but it was sometime in October of 1621, the first Thanksgiving, when Massasoit arrived, it's sort of, guess who's coming to dinner in Plymouth in 1621? It's Massasoit, oh yeah, with 90 of his braves. Let me tell you, those guys came with an appetite. This wasn't tremendously good news for the four four only women who had to provide for all these guys. We'll tell you how they did it right after this. Who 
were the real heroes of that first Thanksgiving in a gorgeous autumn day, actually a gorgeous autumn three days of 1621. I can give you their names. The names of the real heroes, actually heroines, were Elizabeth Hopkins, Eleanor Billington, Mary Brewster, and Susanna Winslow. They were, at the time, the only four adult women who survived. And they oversaw the cooking and the preparations, with the help of some children, for 140 people, some 50 pilgrims, and some 90 Indian braves. Massasoit arrived a day early, a day before he was invited, and he brought along these 90 braves before these four women who had to cook for this crowd completely despaired. Massasoit showed that the Braves came along with a bunch of dressed deer. Now, this added greatly to the bill of fare, which uh, we know included cod, sea bass. Wouldn't that be interesting if we had a traditional sea bass for Thanksgiving? Wild fowl, including ducks, geese, turkeys, and swans, cornmeal, and probably some wheat, and then those five deer brought by the Indians cranberries, maybe. Cranberry sauce, uh uh-uh. They didn't have sugar to make the cranberry sauce that we enjoy today. Popcorn, that's just a story. This wasn't the kind of corn that lent itself for popping. What do we know about the way that they enjoyed this particular three-day feast? Well, we know that it was their custom to sit out of doors on cloth-covered tables, on benches and forms, A few of the more important men would have chairs. Probably Massasoit would have gotten a chair. They ate with knives and a few spoons, but no forks. Forks basically had not been invented yet. They were not used by Englishmen. What they used instead of forks was very large linen napkins, about three feet square. Now, this was very important, not only to wipe your mouth, but because hands were used to both serve and eat. You would often use the napkin to pick up some of the food in the napkin. The dishes and trenchers, those were small square round wooden plates, were used, and very often two people would share one of these. The food was taken from serving bowls or platters and perhaps cut on a trencher before it was eaten or just eaten without being cut. What's the description that we have of this first Thanksgiving? The entire tradition of the first Thanksgiving, is based on one account by Edward Winslow, an eyewitness, he was there, who wrote, Our harvest being gotten in, our governor sent four men on fowling, that so we might, after a special manner, rejoice together after we had gathered the fruit of our labors. They four in one day killed as much fowl as, with a little help beside, served the company almost a week, at which time, amongst other recreations, we exercised our arms, Many of the Indians coming amongst us, and among the rest their greatest king, Massasoit, with some ninety men, whom for three days we entertained and feasted, and they went out and killed five deer, which they brought to the plantation, and bestowed on our governor, and upon the captain and others. And although it be not always so plentiful as it was at this time with us, yet by the goodness of God we are so far from want that we often wish you partakers of our plenty. So he wrote back to some of those who were back home in England. It was a feast of Thanksgiving, but more related to the traditional British country harvest home than to some of the solemn feasts that the Puritans and including the separatists also engaged in. Remember, these were people who did not observe Christmas, did not observe Easter. They thought they were pagan holidays. They did not observe saint days. They did their own feasts of thanksgiving and their own special days of fasting and humiliation. Their service was very dramatic, the way that they worshipped God. There's a description from 1627 from a Dutch visitor. His name was Isaac de Rassier, and he says, They assemble by the beat of drum, each with his musket or firelock in front of the captain's door. They have their cloaks on, and place themselves in order, three abreast, and are led by a sergeant without beat of drum. Behind comes the governor in a long robe. Beside him on the right hand comes the preacher with his cloak on, and on the left hand the captain with his side arms and his cloak on, and with a small cane in his hand. And so they march in good order, and each sets his arms down near him. They made a point of bringing their arms 
their guns with them to divine service. This is on the Sabbath. By the way, they spent most of the Sabbath in divine service with remarkable dedication. And what did they listen to? Well, they listened to some fairly remarkable music. We'll hear just a bit of it after we return. For a recording of today's broadcast on cassette or CD, contact Tree Farm Communications, 1-800-468-0464, or click the button marked History Tapes at michaelmedved.com. One of the mistakes that people make about the pilgrims is they assume that they were Quakers, pacifists, wearing black, rejecting the ways of the world, or otherwise people sometimes think of them as Mennonites or Amish. They were none of these things. I mean, for one thing, they wore bright colors. They did not wear all dark clothes. They did not wear all conical hats with buckles on them. In fact, they didn't wear buckles at all. How do we know what they wore? Well, partially because, well, of of wills that people left behind with their clothing in it specified. For instance, William Bradford, longtime governor, died in May of 1657. His will showed that he owned a house in Plymouth, valued at 45 pounds, an orchard and several parcels of land at Plymouth, a great beer bowl, very important for pilgrims, and two smaller ones, beer, the preferred beverage, six leather chairs, three carved chairs, a great chair, at a court cupboard, ten and a half pairs of sheets, a large quantity of table linen, about five dozen pewter dishes, and, get this, a red turkey grogram suit of clothes, a red waistcoat or vest, and one sad-colored suit, but then a stuffed suit with silver buttons, and an old violet-colored cloak, and two hats, a black one and a colored one. Not only did they enjoy wearing colors, But they were by no means pacifists. Miles Standish was the commander of the full-armed might of the Plymouth Colony. Sixteen armed men. They used that armed might. They loved their guns. They, uh, in fact, brought their guns with them to divine worship. Did leave them outside. But associated guns with celebration, with the Sabbath. In other words, these people were not only the Christian right of the time, and so they were perceived, They were also gun nuts, big time. Remember the description of the first Thanksgiving in 1621? What did they do with the Indians? They shot off their guns. And that was something of the way that you expressed enjoyment or celebration. And when they marched to the service on Sunday, yes, they stacked their guns outside once they reached the meeting house. And when they did so, the men... And the boys, who were 16 years and older, marched off to one side of the meeting house, and the women and the remaining children sat on the other side. It was very important, from a pilgrim point of view, to show the difference in roles, to worship together at the same place, but from a separate position in the service. And that place of worship, that meeting house, of course, was not referred to as a church. It was a meeting house. The building was no more sacred than the candle by which the Bible was read. In fact, besides serving as a place of worship, that meeting house would also be used as a courtroom, and in Plymouth it was used as the fort as well. No stained glass, no decoration of any kind. They were distrustful of that kind of ornamentation. And what kind of service would they engage in? Well, first of all, there were two services on Sunday. One was not enough. The first one was nine to noon, Then that would be interrupted for a light repast. Then they would come back from 2 to 5 for intensive biblical study. And then at 5 o'clock would be Sunday dinner, which would be the richest, most hearty meal of the week, followed very often by a nap from all of that study, worship, and rejoicing. In the service itself, there would not be any hymns sung. They felt that hymns were not biblical. They had been composed later. Instead, there would be prayers that would be spoken from the heart, not by liturgy or formulation. The Lord's Prayer was considered a model to be followed, but it was not slavishly copied. Prayer was given by the pastor or teacher, 
At one point in the service, he would stand up, everyone else would arise, and the speaker would remove his hat, raise his eyes, lift up his arms, and speak. At the end, people would say amen. But there were also psalms that were sung, and the psalms that were sung would sound exactly like this. How do we know exactly how the music in Plymouth Colony sounded so long ago? Well, we know because they carried with them a cherished book, the Ainsworth Psalter, a setting and translation of psalms, which was their favorite form of music. People played it, they sang it, they cherished it. And that same Dutch visitor, Isaac de Rassier, who came in 1627, was deeply impressed with the piety of the Pilgrim Fathers. He had come from various Dutch settlements. Here's what he noted, in addition to them marching to church on the Sabbath day. He seemed to be particularly interested in the Indian women of the New World. He described the Indian women as fine-looking, of middle stature, well-proportioned, and with finely cut features. Usually, a gift of salmon, he said, was sufficient to make them lascivious. That was uh, something he had apparently experimented with. He said they're very libidinous and very unfaithful. But when he came to Plymouth, de Rossier recounts his shock on learning that the pilgrims, of all things, have stringent laws and ordinances upon the subject of fornication and adultery. The laws do not in themselves surprise him so much, since the Dutch had similar laws, but the pilgrims, amazingly enough, enforce theirs very strictly. More surprising still was that the pilgrims interpreted these laws as applying to uh, no messing around with Indian women. Faith was not a trivial matter for this colony. It was what the colony was all about. And when difficulties were encountered, the natural inclination was to solve those difficulties with prayer. Or, when there was one difficulty encountered regarding the economic structure of the colony, to solve those difficulties by restructuring that economy. In 1623, all of a sudden, the recognition came by Governor William Bradford that the collective socialist model that the colony had been set up on wasn't working. Everybody had a share of whatever was produced, but this didn't motivate people properly. So finally, Governor Bradford instituted the New World's very first privatization. Faced with a crisis, he wrote in his diary, the colonists began to think how they might raise as much corn as they could and obtain a better crop than they had done, that they might not still languish in misery. And so Bradford assigned to every family a parcel of land. What a concept. What happened? We shall find out. This is the Michael Medved Show. For a recording of today's broadcast on cassette or CD, contact Tree Farm Communications. Dial toll-free 1-800-468-0464 or click the button marked History Tapes at michaelmedved.com. Privatization works. That's what a privatizer named William Bradford, governor of Plymouth Colony, found out in 1623. Uh, what he wrote in his diary is that the previous collective policy, where everybody worked together, pooled their resources, and that got divided, he said that policy, quote, proved the vanity of that conceit of Plato's, that the taking away of property and brining community unto a commonwealth would make them happy and flourishing. In fact, he discovered... This policy, quote, was found to breed much more confusion and discontent and retard much employment that would have been to their benefit and comfort. And so Bradford assigned each family its own property. And what happened? Well, what he recorded in his own account is it made all hands very industrious. So as much more corn was planted than otherwise would have been by any means the governor or any other could use and saved him a great deal of trouble and gave far better content. The women now went willingly into the field and took their little ones with them to set corn. 
which before would allege weakness and inability, whom to have compelled would have been thought great tyranny and oppression. No tyranny and oppression, but tremendous results. The yield that year of 1623 was so abundant that amazingly the pilgrims ended with a surplus of corn. They had a lot to celebrate. They declared a second day of Thanksgiving. And this year, with special reason, their beloved governor, William Bradford, was marrying a widow with children named Alice Southworth. Remember, his wife had thrown herself overboard. Again, Massasoit was the guest of honor. This time, he brought his principal wife, three other sachems, and 120 braves. Fortunately, he again brought to some venison and some turkey as well. There was a visitor, and his name was Emmanuel Altam. He described the occasion in a letter home to England to his brother. He wrote, After our arrival in New England, we found all our plantation in good health, and neither man, woman, or child sick. In this plantation is about twenty houses, four or five of which are very pleasant, and the rest, as time will serve, shall be made better. The fishing that is in this country, indeed, it is beyond belief. In one hour we got one hundred cod. And now, to say somewhat of the great cheer we had at the governor's marriage, we had about twelve tasty venisons, besides others, pieces of roasted venison, and other such good cheer and such quantities that I wish you some of our share, for here we have the best grapes that ever you saw, and the biggest, and diverse sorts of plums and nuts, six goats, about fifty hogs and pigs, also diverse hens. A better country was never seen nor heard, for here are a multitude of God's blessing. William Bradford could write, As one small candle may light a thousand, so the light kindled here has shone unto many. Yea, in some sort to our whole nation, we have noted these things, so that you might see their worth and not negligently lose what your fathers have obtained with so much hardship. Let us not lose what all our fathers obtained with so much hardship, but let's also try to understand why it is that the pilgrims are remembered so closely on Thanksgiving Day when most people forget all about the Puritans just next door in Massachusetts Bay, who in so many ways were a more important colony. What's the truth about those Puritans? Were they evil, rotten, witch-hunting bigots? Or were they something else again? We will find out why they helped to build the greatest nation on God's green earth.